finish? No, okay. Sean, I'm just wondering if you might be able to um, um, assign me the, uh, or send me the API token or assign me captioning privileges, and then I can just embed it. I see a notation here on my job form that I'm supposed to embed. See. Okay, I I don't know how to do that. No. Um, There's a button down on the bottom right set that says closed captioning. Is there something I should do there or? Uh, if you, yeah, try that one. And if not, it might be up at the top somewhere. View, let me just view option. Yeah, your buttons are a little different than mine. Um, request remote control. There's. Uh, there's a thing called annotate. Um, no. Okay. Well, I guess we'll just leave it, I guess. <laughs> okay. I see people are slowly drifting in. Someone's going to have to edit all this early stuff. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Harmon. I'm a member of the Health Law Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, third installment of the 2022-23 HLI seminar series. Um, this is our first seminar this year that is back online. Um, so hopefully we will avoid any uh, technical uh, difficulties. Um, please note on your systems that there is a uh, a Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, we'll, have, we'll have time for questions and comments at the end of the talk. Um, you, can, you can post them on the Q&A and, um, and I'm told I will, have, uh, I will be able to see those and we'll, we'll read them out uh, and deal with them in, in order. Um, talk will be about 40 to 50 minutes. We'll have about 20 minutes to uh, have questions and comments. Prior to getting underway, I should acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq Key, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we endeavor to pay respect to the Indigenous knowledge held by the Mi'kmaq people and to the wisdom of their elders. The Mi'kmaq people signed peace and friendship treaties with the Crown, and we are all now treaty people. Um, there is closed captioning. There should be a button on the bottom of your screen that uh, you can press to initiate this function. Uh, I've never tried it, so I'm not 100% sure how it works, but we do have um, closed captioning. Uh, so let me introduce our esteemed speaker today. We are joined by, and I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer Pra, um, who has a very uh, impressive CV, and I'm just going to uh, hit some of the highlights of her, of her biography. Uh, she is the Amartya Sen Professor of Health Equity, Economics and Policy, Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Center for Global Health, and a Senior Fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute for Health Economics and the Center for Public Health Initiatives, all at the University of Pennsylvania. She is founder and director of the Health Equity and Policy Lab, which conducts quantitative and qualitative research on the equity implications of health and social policies. She conducts theoretical and empirical studies of health equity to reduce global and national health inequalities, drawing on her training in political economy, health policy, international relations, comparative social research, and law. Her work re-examines the values and principles that underlie health policy and public health and applies these principles empirically which is uh, something that I've done over the years. And so I'm very much especially looking forward to this talk um, today. Uh, as we will hear more about, uh, Dr. Pra has created the health capability paradigm and has developed an empirical approach to evaluate public health programs and health policies as they measure up to that paradigm. Dr. Pra has served on several international and US advisory and expert review committees and is the past chair of the ethics special primary interest group of the American Public Health Association. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Pra. 
I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you to you and Sheila and Ashley for all your work in inviting me and in, uh, making this um, seminar happen. I am just delighted to be here as part of the Health Law and Policy Seminar Series um, uh, sponsored by the Health Law Institute at Dalhousie University. Um, the only regret I have is that I'm not there in person. Um, so um, I've heard it's such a beautiful part of this world. I am gonna talk about um, the uh, operationalizing the health justice, health justice through the health capability profile. Um, and as Sean just mentioned in that very generous um, introduction, I've been working on um, the health capability paradigm and the health capability profile, which is what I'd like to share with you today. And I very much look forward to your feedback. So we'll start with understanding um, what health capability is. Health capability is an ability or it's um, a kind of power to perform with the potential for achieving desired ends. It entails an aptitude. Um, it's a cradle to grave concept um, that requires lifelong abilities and conditions. Um, and the, the idea is that, that it enables optimal health and flourishing. Health capabilities are key strengths. They result from our societal and individual commitments um, of human, financial, physical resources. Um, and that's with the goal of helping to people thrive and flourish. Um, differences in health capabilities help us understand, for example, why um, personal determination and skills or health beliefs alone are not enough. Um, why people with even the very best external conditions can still have poor health, and why a narrow biomedical model of disease is insufficient. So this is the health capability model in its sort of conceptual framework. We have biology and genetic predisposition. We have intermediate social contexts. We have public health and healthcare systems. We have the macro social, political, and economic environment. And sort of at the center of all of this is, is health capability, the confidence and ability to be effective in achieving optimal health, given one's biological and gen genetic predisposition and the intermediate and the broader social, political and economic environment, um, as well as access to public health and healthcare systems. So health capability captures the interactive and dynamic and multidimensionality of health and flourishing. Um, so where the circles overlap, this figure gives a an, an representation of the way that individual and social factors interact to create health capability. And we'll talk more about that um, later. The health capability model is, um, is different um, from other uh, models. And um, some of the ways it's different are that linear models um, tend to be limited to one-to-one -to -one associations <clears throat> among variables. And so even when we have interactive terms in these li linear models, <clears throat> excuse me, and even when, control, when one controls for a number of variables, we still see these kinds of limitations. Reductionist models examine simple relationships first, and then they sum the principal subcomponents and then we have an aggregated form of something that can be very difficult to interpret or understand the dynamics and the interactive nature of something. The health capability model is a more flexible analytical approach. Um, it accounts for both internal and external influences at the individual level. It allows for contemporaneous multiple relationships among factors. Its overlapping feature offers a nuanced and sequentially interactive, iterative, and dynamic um, and multidimensional understanding. And so the model helps reveal heterogeneity in the influence of irreducibly social goods and experiences on an individual and the individual's influence on society. Some strengths of the health capability model, we believe, are, are its effectiveness in terms of longitudinal over time, intersectoral and multisectoral policy and institutional analysis and design, um, allowing for heterogeneous relations um, among individuals and society level variables. So in, at society level, we have income, education, we have race, but we have also racism 
sexism, gender discrimination, heteronormativity, um, and LGBTQ plus rights. Um, in terms of capability capital, we have capital that occurs and accrues at the personal and interpersonal level, the institutional level, and structural. So we're trying to understand these different, different levels. And, and it, there's a there's something about this that's that's attempting to address problems of a lack of information in terms of what's going on with respect to the direct impact of external factors by measuring a different kind of construct health capability as opposed to other kinds of constructs. So it incorporates external factors into the individual level and the impacts of individuals on society. Rather than trying to draw an inference about an individual and individual's health based on group or macro level characteristics, such as demographic information that is measured categorically in different groups. The health capability profile is operationalized into a measurable profile and an index. Um, it is uh, the health capability profile comprises 15 different health capabilities, and we're going to go through those. Though that 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 then encompass 49 separate health functionings and agencies. The profile then snapshots and tracks the health capabilities development. So the idea here is developing health capabilities. And the goal is for each and every person to reach their highest potential, their full health capability. And then this get, provides a full, a full picture of a person's lived experience and their journey to, reach, um, to reaching their health and flourishing potential. So here are the different um, health capabilities. And this is also information that's available on our website at the Health Equity and Policy Lab. The first, I said, and I mentioned there were 15 different um, health capabilities. The first internal health capability is health status and health functioning. This is your state of health, um, where you actually are in terms of your health functioning. Internal capability two is health knowledge. This is knowing about your health and knowing how to be healthy. Internal capability three is health seeking skills and beliefs and a sense of self efficacy. This is your belief in yourself and your health. Internal capability four is health values and goals. Um, this is valuing health. Internal capability five is a sense of self governance and self management and and also your perceived one's perceived self governance and management and um, to achieve health outcomes. Internal capability six um, is effective health decision making, making good decisions for health. Internal capability seven is intrinsic motivation. This is being self motivated towards health. Internal capability eight is positive expectations. Um, and so this is having positive expectations about one's health and flourishing. Then we have our external capabilities. Our external capability. Uh, is uh, nine is social norms. This is the cultures of health and the expected behaviors in a society. External capability 10 is social networks and social capital for achieving positive health outcomes, connecting to others for health. For health. External capability 11 is um, the group membership influences and these are health norms of your social groups. External capability 12 is material circumstances. This is having material circumstances that support health. External capability 13 is economic, political, and social security, general feelings of security. And the external capability 14 is utilization and access to health services. This is receiving health care when needed. And then finally, external capability 15 is an enabling public health and health care system. And that's the effectiveness of these health systems. So this is a very comprehensive um, profile in which we have these 15 different internal health capabilities and external health capabilities, which to, together, again, as I said, interactively um, work to create our ability to be healthy. So here we're just going to, this is, again, is all on our website, but I wanted to go through just like a couple of the different capabilities. So you have a, a, a one, a, an internal capability, an external capability. So you have a, a sense of how this, how this works. Um, so here's the internal capability for health values and goals. This is valuing health. 
So in overview, this is a kind of um, valuing our health, valuing health-related goals, valuing life lifestyle choices and behaviors, our ability to recognize and counter damaging or, 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 um, or positive uh, social norms. So what is it? Health values and goals is the internal capability of valuing one's health. So including health-related goals and health-promoting behaviors. Health-related goals refer to, to objectives well, a person has for one's health, like healthy cholesterol levels or weight or other kinds of goals. An example of a health-promoting behavior and lifestyle choice on um, behavior is a regular exercise, a healthy diet, active lifestyle. The capability also includes the ability to recognize and counter damaging um, social norms that undermine that undermine the value of health or, or, or to persist in one's uh, values despite negative social messaging. So what, and then again, we have this on our website. This really helps us understand, you know, why is this important? What does it look like? And how do we do, how do we do it? How do I do it? So why, why is it important? Well, health values and goals are important because we live in a world of finite resources, including our own resources of attention, energy, time. And health will not be achieved if it is not prioritized. So value is something we prioritize. So health values and goals allow us to understand that health is central to a good life and should be treated as such by all of us. Um, health values and goals ensure that we, we see what is truly important in life and we actually go and pursue it. Again, valuing something is prioritizing. What is truly important? What takes priority? What does it look like? Someone with a high internal health value and goals capability expresses their values through both their own words and their actions. They may speak positively of health, health-related goals, healthy lifestyle choices and behaviors, as well as explicitly countering social norms that damage health or other, other kinds of things that damage one's health. Health values and goals will have a high priority in their life, including in how they structure their own pursuits, their, their daily schedule, their short-term and long-term priorities, their free time, their plans, et cetera. So how do I do it? Health values and goals can be continuously developed. And that's the whole idea behind health capability it is a cradle to grave, continuously developing. Questions to ask yourself may include, why is my health important to me? How do I practice and honor that in my daily life? What resources am I committing to my health? What are some goals I can set that will help me become healthier? What is my lifestyle saying about what matters to me? How might I change some of my um, lifestyle habits to have health as a top priority? What are some social norms that detract from my health? How might I respond to them? How might I put myself in a position to benefit from social norms? Now, here is um, an external capability of social norms. This is the culture of health and the expected behaviors in a society. And here we're looking at the extent to which health norms are scientifically valid and evidence-based, the extent to which health behaviors and health-seeking skills are viewed favorably. So cultures of abstinence from, from drugs, alcohol, um, or unfavorably cultures of alcohol abuse within a family, other kinds of abuse or violent behavior. Um, extent to which health behavior is adopted by a majority or minority of the population and the culture. Um, Extent to which discrimination or anti-discrimination is the dominant norm in the provision of healthcare and public health services that influences disparities in access. Norms about decisional latitude or power in familial and social contexts. Society's ability to recognize and counter damaging social norms and promote positive ones. So what is it? What is this external capability? Social norms are an external capability that encompass a variety of health promoting norms across different social domains. Firstly, a strong social norm uh, capability includes scientifically valid and evidence-based health norms. Secondly, health behaviors and health seeking skills are viewed favorably. Health behaviors are adopted by most of the population. And society is able to recognize and counter damaging social norms and promote positive ones. Anti-discrimination is, is, is the dominant norm in society. 
social norms in the provision of health care and public health services ameliorate disparities in access and norms about decisional attitude or power, familial and social context are conducive to each person's health agency. That's their ability to achieve health goals they value. The culture and expected behavior in society empower each and every person to be healthy. Why is it important? Social norms are impor an important external capability because they shape our beliefs and actions. What we consider acceptable, valuable, important, normal. What is expected in order to belong to society? Living in a society where health is scientifically understood, widely regarded as important and supported, institutionalized as a priority, and where people are encouraged and sustained in being active agents of their own health, this is a critical capability for one's health. What does it look like? A society with positive social norm external capability will demonstrate scientifically accurate health norms, such as social norms of childhood vac vaccination, annual influenza immunizations, respectful and anti-discriminatory discriminatory expectations about behavior and empathy and care towards each other to thrive. Seeking and receiving vaccination and immunizations are viewed positively in social circles and professional settings. And all the population is um, seeking these kinds of vaccinations and immunizations. Healthcare and public health providers practice anti-discriminatory service provision to ensure underserved populations and communities are properly served. And children's health is not put at risk due to power imbalances in the parent-child relationship and unscientific beliefs of the parents. Public moral norms of justice, equity, and fairness are important here. And the goals of public health and health policy are to serve everyone and benefit all. How do we do it? We can develop our health capability of social norms through promoting positive pu health and public health moral norms through individuals as well as institutions such as the media, governmental agencies, academia, and popular culture. So the health capability profile, as I said, it's a flexible and detailed multidimensional typology. It's a dynamic framework. It focuses on implementation sciences. So we want to focus on identifying gaps between observed health capabilities and optimal um, level of health capability. It has a normative dimension. The health capability paradigm that was mentioned earlier advances principles that ensure that individuals in society work together towards the health capabilities for all. So there's a, there is a strong normative dimension to this. How do we apply the health capability profile? Well, first we have to adapt the profile. And what we do in this case, and we've been, we've been doing this in, in the work uh, conjunction with our collaborators in our lab, we adapt the profile to a particular health condition or a particular and or a particular setting. The methods um, that we've been using and that can be used are mixed methods. Um, and this is quantitative and qualitative and social justice at the core in the sense of a normative framework that privileges all individuals' ability to be healthy. It's not for certain groups and, and not others, it's for all. And there are quantitative and qualitative data collection that occur in adapting the profile. Then there's data integration, flow diagrams, which I'm gonna show you some today, and there's also zero to 100 health capability scores. So in each of these 15 different health capabilities, we come up with a zero to 100 score and also stages of development of that particular health capability, which helps us understand the overall health capability of a person. This can then feed into policy change towards health capability for all. So here are some of the research questions that we've um, been focusing on. How can the health capability profile be applied to investigate contemporary public health problems? And we're working on a three-step methodology. What insights can it provide to inform behavioral, programmatic, and policy change? And I'm gonna show you just a couple of illustrations um, from the work um, that we've been doing. And, on a couple public uh, health issues that are pressing for women 
and the LGBTQ plus um, community. All right, so in terms of methods, here's how it works. Um, we have understanding the profile as a whole. And this involves um, the 15 separate but interconnected health capabilities that I just um, showed you. This is encompassing 49 functionings and agencies. Then we're creating the ability to achieve optimal health now in the future through the process of developing capabilities. Applying the profile to specific cases, components of the profile are, are, are the, the coding matrix, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then quantification of observed capabilities versus the optimal level of uh, capability. And then we have interactions among health capabilities, among those 15 capabilities. So when we employ the profile to promote health capability, we identify different leverage points. We prioritize those leverage points in terms of implementation and effectiveness. And then there's a positionality in terms of society and individuals together working towards the health capability of all people. So the kind of methods that we've been involved with are um, deductive content analysis. Um, and this is using theory or theoretical frameworks or, concept or a conceptual model um, to analyze data by operationalizing them in a coding matrix. Um, we have couched and developed the health capability profile in the context of our theory of the health capability paradigm and our theory of promoting the ability to be healthy. The, the three-step analysis is you understand a case study through the prism of the health capability profile. You construct the flow diagrams, and this is the quantification of the capabilities level of development observed in relation to the optimal. And then there's a characterization of the detrimental or the enabling interactions among capabilities that overall enable or inhibit somebody from the ability to be healthy. And then there's recommended policy changes that can help promote health capabilities as a result of this analysis. So constructing the um, flow diagrams is um, the narrative part of this. Um, and that's dividing um, this narrative. And I'm gonna show you these scenarios that we've been working on. Um, into meaningful units. And these range from a few words to a few sentences. Units are then classified into one of several of the 15 health capabilities. Units are quantified in terms of their health capability development and placed on a left to right uh, continuum from nil, which is not very developed um, and is an extreme shortfall in somebody's ability to be healthy in that particular health capability to realistically or what's possible or to actually the optimal level of development. And this is how um, we get the detrimental or the positive causal interactions that are depicted. And I'll show you that we, we put them in red and green arrows respectively, but this is to, to basically understand what the dynamic and interactive nature is among these 15 different health capabilities, external and internal, in terms of the overall ability to be healthy of a person. Okay, so when we're employing the profile, um, there's positionality. Um, and so this is individuals and society working together to create and foster healthy lives. And the way that that we, in, we incorporate the positionality in the health capability profile is the internal capabilities and the external capabilities. So this is really neither complete paternalism where we're you know, really about sort of telling people how they should act and what they should be doing or unbridled autonomy where it's just people out there doing whatever they want, whenever they want. There's a really much more of a nuanced and, a, and a, um, a middle ground there in terms of developing people's agency to make positive choices and then creating the conditions that make it possible for them to develop these capabilities. 
So here we're recommending a set of realistic interventions and policies um, to transition uh, detrimental interactions into positive ones. And this is to ensure an optimal uh, development in the combination of each uh, health capability. So then we have priority ranking, we have shortfall inequality and effectiveness. And that is when there is a shortfall in the capability um, and, um, and then figuring out the effectiveness in addressing that. Um, all right, so in, in, this, um, in this application, we've um, had a sampling strategy and we, we've been an analyzing explanatory case studies and there are ways to, to um, choose what kind of case studies um, to analyze through uh, the prism of the health capability paradigm. We could look at the leading causes of death. And here are the leading causes of death. We have heart disease, cancer, accidents, lower respiratory disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, Alzheimer's, kidney, intentional self-harm, suicide. These are leading causes of death. We also have pressing public health issues. COVID is um, at the top of the list, uh, substance use disorder, structural racism, domestic violence, LGBTQ plus discrimination, gun violence, sexual harassment, structural racism, obesity, anorexia, infertility. So these are the ways to, to um, um, choose different cases um, to analyze um, with uh, and apply the health capability profile. And there are other, we, we have a study going on um, where we're looking at uh, chronic hepatitis B in Senegal, applying the, the profile where we develop, we've developed the questionnaire um, and are doing are collecting quantitative and qualitative data in a mixed methods capacity. Um, there's other kinds of um, um, case studies. So we, we're, I'm just going to um, present some public health issues focused on women and LGBTQ plus um, uh, populations to just give you a sense of how um, to apply the um, profile in these particular cases. So here we have a particular case study, um, and this is S. Um, S is a 25 year old um, graduated from a very good university, found a job at a prestigious news outlet company, her boss is very famous. He's been in the industry for 30 years, has connections with rich and powerful people, including elected officials and businessmen. S feels very lucky to join this team. The first week goes well, but S is growing uncomfortable with the boss's behavior. He has a certain way of looking at her, complimenting, flattering her, whimsically talking with her, being near and around her. One day he requests um, a private meeting at his place after hours. Um, when S tried to reschedule, her boss said, you know, are you not committed to this job in your career? As S's boss behaves increasingly inappropriately during the meeting, S feels endangered and she runs away. The next day, he threatens to ruin her reputation if she talks. S loses sleep. She has stomach aches um, before she goes to work. She meets with the HR officer and the company doctor, but neither of them report the incident. She also tries to broach the topic with her coworkers. They tell her that's not the first, um, she's not the first one to speak up, but nothing changes. She eventually decides to quit. It takes a few years to regain her mental health because there've been major mental health implications of this experience and also to put her career back on track. So let's look at what this looks like from a health capability profile perspective. So as I, I was saying before, the green we we on the in the green and on the right side of this flow diagram, we represent um, positive um, development in terms of the health capabilities. So on the positive side, S is motivated, she's resourceful and proactive in terms of strong beliefs and skills, self-governance and management, decision-making, motivation, values, and goals. On the red side or the deficit side, there's a culture um, of domination and power structures. Those are the social norms um, that 
that that this experience is um, is all about. Um, the company is protecting toxic behaviors. That's a group membership kind of a capability. Um, and these are linked and related. They are interacting in this particular scenario. There's an inertia of HR and healthcare professionals in, in this um, scenario. And so that's not enabling um, in terms of the healthcare system and the, and, the, and the sense of security in this particular scenario. And these are related to the social norms because the social norms create the context for this kind of inertia um, on the part of um, these parts of the institution. She's, her functioning is very debilitated because she's losing sleep and she has anxiety and stress. She's having major mental health ramifications as a result of this experience. Um, she has to quit her job and does not feel um, like she can continue in this um, situation because she loses hope. Um, and so her expectations are um, negatively impacted. And this is um, impacted by the social norms. It's, it's impacted by the group membership that she's a part of. So this is how these interactions are occurring. This affects her career and her losing hope and quitting her job uh, affects her career. And these kinds of experiences are all interconnected. So what does it look like to change things? What it looks like is to, to change from the experience where we had a culture of male domination and power structures to a culture of equality and respect. So instead of being over here in the red where we're having this cascade of interactions and dynamic flow of negative interactions and experiences, which is creating this, these detriments in her ability to be healthy, we're switching now and we're transforming and developing a culture of equality and respect. And that shifts things in the direction of a positive external capability of social norms. That the interconnectedness that we saw in the prior experience. So now these are shifting from, from red to, to gray because they're transitioning, transforming as a result of the link with the norms and the cultural change towards equality and respect. We see differences in terms of how people are, are treated, um, protected, promoting equality, promoting respect, companies promoting a healthy work environment. And so now we see relationships between a culture of equality and respect, a, a promoting a healthy work environment, protecting um, and promoting equality and, and, and respect among staff. We see a general sense of optimism and wellness um, that is related to um, other uh, capabilities functioning and expectations. These are internal capabilities. So this is how external capabilities and internal capabilities are interacting in a positive shift to move things in a positive direction. And then we see good career and living conditions for people and an overall better experience. Here's another example. This is you. You is 35. She went to her doctor for a checkup. She was worried because she's been trying to get pregnant for over two years. She was very connected to her body and she's able to identify her ovulation days. She has been monitoring a diet and doing regular physical exercises. During her visit, she mentioned that she experiences very painful periods and she always has. Her doctor replied that all women are in pain during their menstruation and that she just needs to be patient and relax in order to get pregnant. At home, you searches period pain and infertility on the internet, and she finds information on endometriosis. Realizing that she exhibits most of these symptoms, she asks her doctor for an MRI. 
he says she would wait at, she should wait another year before suspecting endometriosis. 12 months later, when you finally does the MRI, it confirms that she does indeed have endometriosis and that the disease has progressed to the point that there is nothing that can be done to, to prevent her infertility. The specialist uh, further uh, tells her that if her condition had been diagnosed earlier, she probably would have been able to freeze her eggs and attempt an in, in vitro fertilization. So let's look at what this looks like in terms of the um, uh, in, uh, the um, flow diagram. So we see that you is motivated. She values health and learned skills. This is high values and skills and motivation, health capabilities. And these are related. to beliefs and skills. Then we see decision-making and self-governance and management. She's seeking information and controlling and controlling her behavior. These are all positive things that she's doing. These are positive developments in her, in these in, in, internal health capabilities. We also see her using healthcare and accessing it and accessing it. But you is but she's not getting pregnant. Her functioning has been compromised. That's not working. It is related to her being uh, utilizing and accessing healthcare. But we have the physician's belief that women's periods are to be painful. This is the social norm that's embedded in the institution in which she is operating and she is engaging. That's a negative part that is compromising the healthcare system to be enabling for her in the situation. It's also compromising and detrimental to her access and utilization. It's also been detrimental to her knowledge she ignores her condition. And then that in, in turn affects her ability to get pregnant and to function, which is not, um, not happening. This, this healthcare utilization and access is having a negative impact on her functioning. And her infertility sadly is irreversible. And so her expectations are negatively impacted. And that is a way in which we see this interaction of internal cap health capabilities and external health capabilities. And, and in that particular situation, there wasn't any, um, any further thing that can be done. Another example here, we have P who has been married for 10 years. She met her husband in college and they married upon graduation. Over the years, her husband had grown very controlling. He started with making remarks about her high school friends, which he didn't like very much, and asked that she spend more time with him at night. He then refused to celebrate holidays with P's family. When she became a mother, he told P it would be better if she quit her job as an office clerk to look after their child and that he could provide for the family. P never pictured herself as a stay-at-home mother, but she's doing her best to adjust. Often her husband comes home angry and gets mad at her for small things, such as, the, such as the food not being to his liking. He regularly talks her down. Sometimes he even insults her. He, he has threatened to be violent a couple of times. One evening, he went to the police. The officer asked her if she realized that her husband would, uh, realized that her husband would be arrested and sent to jail and therefore won't be able to provide for her family anymore. Her husband begged for forgiveness and threatened to kill himself if she ever considered leaving him. She also mentioned issues with hu the hu husband to her GP, um, her, her provider, but the physician did not inquire further. She really has no one to talk to. She is not a member of any association or club, and she hasn't seen her relatives in over two years. So what does this look like? Um, P is cut off from friends and family by her abusive husband. 
this is a detriment to her social capital and networks. P is emotionally abused. This is a detriment to her functioning. And these two are interacting with each other. There's gender inequality and male domination as a social norm that is, is, is the context for this situation. That's impacting her social capital and networks, which is impacting her functioning. The institutions and the police are not protecting her, so there's not a sense, there's a detriment in terms of a sense of overall security for P. And this is impacted by the gender inequality and male domination that is the social norm in this context. P is feeling hope, helpless and loses hope, um, which is impacting her internal capabilities, uh, her beliefs and skills, her self-governance and management, her expectations. And these are all impacted by her, the, the um, detriment in her social capital and her networks. On the positive side, she is seeking help. She is seeking access to the healthcare system and, and utilizes it for her, her annual checkups but she did not get the response that she needed um, from the GP. That was not an enabling healthcare system in this um, setting. And that was affected by the gender inequality and the, and the male domination and the social norms. She has a nice house. She has very good um, uh, housing, um, but this, this depends on her husband's job. So her material circumstances are somewhat in the middle, they are, she has a nice house, but there's a contingency and there's a dependency there that's compromising her ability. That's impacted by um, the social capital and the networks that are comp compromised in this system. So these are the kinds of ways in which this is interacting. Here's another example, this is Q. Um, Q is a 30 year old who broke his wrist social um, baseball game. HIV is undetectable for now. His partner takes him to the nearest hospital for emergency surgery. Um, the check-in process goes smoothly. Q has a very good, has very good health insurance provided by a stable job. Um, and he has to stay overnight to be operated on first thing in the morning. Past visiting hours, Q's partner returns to the hospital and gives a few pills to the nurse on duty, explaining that Q needs to take his daily HIV medication, which he had forgotten at home. The next day, Q sets, sur gets surgery and is kept for observation. Q repeatedly asks for his HIV prescription, but his reference nurse ignores him after mumbling, one gets what one deserves. Q gets extremely ang anxious. He knows that disruption in his medication might compromise the control of his HIV viral load and destroy his efforts to ensuring that his HIV remains undetectable and therefore untransmittable. His main goal, since he found out he had HIV. So he has a good job and insurance, a supportive partner, um, so economic, social, political security, material circumstances, social capital are all positive. Um, healthcare access and utilization is somewhat positive um, because he is accessing care. There's a sense of homophobia and LGBTQ plus discrimination that um, is related to the social norms in this context. Um, there's staff discrimination um, because of sexual orientation um, that compromises the healthcare system. Um, and this is related to the social norm of, uh, of, uh, um, of um, discrimination and homophobia. And this relates to healthcare access um, and Q gets surgery, but discontinues um, the HIV medication. Q is worried about, um, about um, the, the, H, the management of his own uh, HIV. And this, um, but he does have, um, the resources, and um, that does positively impact his uh, healthcare utilization. He's knowledgeable, and motivated, and skilled as he monitors his HIV. So his knowledge and motivation and values and skills are high. Um, and so this is this is all positive. His self governance and management and beliefs are high, and these are all related to each other. So knowledge helps self governance. Motivation helps beliefs and skills and values and goals is also related to um, uh, knowledge affects self-governance, 
motivation affects um, self-governance and values and goals felt affect beliefs and skills. So these are how these are all interacting. And then the his wrist is fixed. And so the functioning of that part is, um, is good and the HIV is undetectable for now. But the healthcare utilization is also negatively impacting that. So let's look at some of the cross cutting. And it's like I said, we these were just a couple, these are scenarios and these are hypothetical scenarios. These are not, these are just hypothetical scenarios that were um, presented to show and demonstrate the impact of looking at um, these particular kinds of public health issues from a health capability profile perspective. So they're pressing public health issues for women in LGBTQ+. And this is a highlight of the, the role, particularly of detrimental social norms of domination and discrimination. The significant shortfalls in social norms, though, however, are a leverage point. So detrimental social norms can unbalance even the strongest profiles where we have very strong internal health capabilities. But when we have these strong external um, social norms, they can be very imbalancing. The overflows, they overflow into the healthcare and public health system as well as institutions. This prevents positive influences from the internal uh, health capabilities. And it affects healthcare access and utilization, which in turn damages health outcomes. So these shortfalls in, in health functioning then can further weaken the profile. And this jeopardizes also expectations and material circumstances. So this is, a, a, again, I mean, just these are hypothetical case studies demonstrating through the prism of the health capability profile how these internal health capabilities and external health capabilities, capabilities interact to positively influence or negatively influences one's overall health capability and then identify the leverage points and the ways in which there are linkages and interactions to intervene to um, ameliorate or better the situation. So when we're talking about promoting health capability, we're talking about leverage points and shortfall inequalities. So the shortfall inequalities are the places where there are the, de these detriments um, and shortfalls in the social norms as a, lever a leverage point. Changing detrimental social norms of domination, bias, and discrimination into norms of equality and respect for all and promotion of wellness and flourishing for all. So, so again, as I said, detrimental social norms can unbalance even the strongest profiles. They can be embedded in healthcare and public health systems as well as institutions. They can prevent positive influences um, from internal capabilities, and they can affect healthcare access and utilization, which in turn damages health outcomes. So the profile enables a transformational shift. It describes the step-by-step -step process of moving from these negative discrimination, bias, abuse experiences to equality and flourishing. It illuminates what the promotion of health capability looks like in a specific case study. And it highlights what it takes to make it happen. So, um, and then I'm gonna finish fairly fairly soon. Um, the profile is very flexible. It can be applied to a wide variety of individual situations and broader settings. It's unique to each individual at one point in time. External capabilities are assessed at the individual level and different social norms experienced by individuals living in the same community. It offers a multi-level analysis. It shows strength versus vulnerability at a glance, as well as a detailed granular information at the health capability level. What does it do? It reveals multiple causes, accurately describes people's complex experiences of intersectionality. It identifies cumulative and heterogeneous effects, allows incorporation of equity concerns. It showcases underlying vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. It provides a roadmap to build individual and collective capabilities. It highlights strengths and positive examples. It illustrates how to achieve optimal health capability. 
There are some limitations, of course. Um, it is prior understanding and in-depth in um, review of the profile. It's very labor intensive. There are my, there are drawbacks in light. It, we think the drawbacks in light of the, in light of what what it allows is that it provides a detailed and accurate understanding of people's complex individual experiences. Um, and this is really very important. It's comprehensive and practicable in terms of a template to achieve collective well being. It's proactive and prevention oriented, and it's a collaborative effort. Um, it's, it can be a valuable tool for clinicians and healthcare professionals, policymakers, and people themselves. And lastly, let me end with health capability and justice. The health, it's, oops. The health capability um, profile is embedded in achieving justice. Um, and achieving justice requires providing people with the conditions to be healthy and flourish. And oops. Um, why? Because we have a societal obligation to transform the conditions where everyone has the ability to be healthy and how the profile shows how to transform the conditions that are detrimental to health and detrimental to flourishing and detrimental to wellness into situations that promote and ensure equality and respect, enable health, enable well being, and enable flourishing. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pra. Um, we now have about 15 minutes for some questions. Um, so if people who, anyone who has a question or a comment can put it in the Q&A and that should then appear in my chat panel and I can, <laughs> and I can uh, read it out. So there are one or two questions now. Um, but I would encourage people to, uh, to think about some more. And I'll um, let, let me ask you this then, uh, Dr. Pra. Um, so I, I think you've demonstrated quite well how the tool can help one organize information and then therefore assess where issues are exerting negative impacts and need to be altered. Um, but there, there might be, this might show that there's a lot that needs to be done beyond the reach of say the physician or the public health official who wants to take decisions or so on. So how do we marshal the resources to make the changes, including some of the cultural changes that, that some of your uh, scenarios identified um, in order to improve outcomes in these scenarios? Thank you for that question. Um, like I said, these are hypothetical scenarios um, to demonstrate um, what can happen um, and what can be done. Um, what we envision with the profile is using it to collect real data. Um, and we are doing that um, in, um, so I mentioned the Senegal project um, we've developed a survey um, at the individual level and, um, and an interview guide um, at the individual and the local level. And so we are collecting data from individuals and from the key stakeholders. Um, and so the idea there is to um, aggregate data across individuals and at these different levels in which this, any particular application of the survey and interview guide can happen to create the information both across individuals and at the community, local, state, provincial, whatever level. So, and then that information data is then um, advanced for policy purposes. So input to policy. Okay. And then with the scenarios, we can show that's the real data the, the, what I just showed you are, like I said, hypothetical case studies. Okay. So what I showed you was 
how then with the data that we, we gather across individuals, it can be used to demonstrate because we will see patterns of transformation to demonstrate how you move from one part of the profile to the other to the, 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 the you know, I just I, I'm I'm now also the director of the Ortner Center on Violence and Abuse. And our um, uh, mission is um, safe, da safe daughters, confident women, strong society. And so the idea is, you know, what are the conditions of abuse and violence and discrimination um, and negative influences to toxicity, to health, unhealthy, to healthy well being and flourishing? And what does that transformation look like? And the, 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 the health capability profile can, can help us see that and can aggregate across individuals to provide the, the information for policymakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions are coming in now. This one's from Josh Shaw. Uh, how do cultural differences in the interpretation of health factor into the model? And he's thinking of differences in understandings of body weight or the help of smoking with managing stress and so on. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I appreciate that. The way that the cult, cultural, as I understand the question, how does cultural, how are cultural values incorporated in the model? Um, they're incorporated in the model by, by asking people. Um, and again, um, the, the, the idea is that we're going to be asking, you know, many people or whoever's using the, the instrument, applying the profile is are asking many people and that across people, we will understand and learn what, um, what the cultural values are and the cultural norms are in those particular societies in those particular contexts. And if I could just follow up on that then, so do you see this then as identifying areas where there might need to be um, value change and, and how do you, how do you, how would, I, I know this particular tool may not sort of speak to, to that, but how do you see the, encouraging the value changes that might need to be made based on the evidence that you're generating. Excellent, thank you so much, that's that's so great. Um, yes, it is possible that value change may be, um, may be necessary. Um, and, um, and that's because of, I mean, you, you may have feel familiar with uh, the ideas like adaptive preferences, um, that people may not have enough information or know what could be possible or what you know what is possible uh, for them because they've never been exposed to it they they didn't they wouldn't know that and so um, the counterfactual or the positive deviance what you know what's possible um, and what's the potential is something that we hope to illuminate and share with people through gathering information through the profile then sharing that information with others who where there may need to be. Um, value change, yes. Um, uh, in terms of, again, sharing the information, showing how this particular set of values may be more conducive to health, well-being, and flourishing for all people in in particular societies, and how that how that is. It's not a black. Hopefully, it's not as much of a black box anymore. It's trying to see actually how that works and why. Um, and showing, you know, the proof of why certain kinds of values are more conducive, um, like equality and respect, mm -hmm. are more conducive to um, more um, flourishing and healthy environments. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got a question here from uh, Ali. Uh, medicine and society have conceptualized um, of a number of kinds of people as problematic in achieving optimal health. Uh, overweight people, people who use drugs, HIV positive, non-adherent people, for example. How does your framework address medicine's own creation of oppression? Thank you. Um, that's excellent. Um, by by trying to um, collect data on it and people's experiencing experiences with it, um, and that's where when I showed you the 
um, enabling or, or not enabling healthcare system um, and the norms that are embedded in the healthcare system, the social norms and the arrows between and by asking people and having them tell us what their experience is with um, those kinds of interactions can illuminate um, why um, the system may or may not be serving um, all people, because the goal is to serve all people, regardless of your addiction status, your weight, you know, that's not, those are just, that's just information to help a person, help them understand whether those factors are enabling them or not to be healthy and to flourish. It's not to judge. It's not to judge. There's no, the, 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 the health capability profile is for every person on the planet. And it's a belief that every person has the ability to be healthy regardless of their, and that's why the predisposition of biological factors is part of the profile. No matter what a person's born with, no matter what their circumstances, are the conditions in place that are developing their internal capabilities and their external capabilities to enable them to be healthy and enable them to flourish. And also to support because equity and justice is the foundation for the profile. And also to ensure that other people have the ability to be healthy and the ability to flourish. That's the project. Mm -hmm. And this hopefully will help us understand what's what whether whether that's occurring or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question here. It's a two part question, I guess, from Andrea. Um, uh, one, um, she's wondering which factors might facilitate or hinder buy in by people or groups who could be using the tool. And then uh, sort of a, a more, a, I guess, a practical question of where might one go to follow up and learn more about where and how the tool is being applied and or used in the future. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Buy-in is, is, is um, all about trying to understand whether it's useful um, and whether it provides information that can be helpful. And so by, by being as detailed and granular as the health capability profile seeks to be, to really be comprehensive, to be rigorous, to show the dynamic and interactive nature of the complex systematic experiences that people are having, it's a system. The health capability profile is a system. Then it, 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 it will help us better understand people's experiences. We know the statistics are ready. The epidemiology has been, has been very helpful. We know disparities in health outcomes exist. We know uh, rates of mental illness are very, very high. We know rates of substance abuse disorders are very high. We know that cancer, we know that all sorts of kinds of disease are very high and are very problematic. What we have been focused less on is how do we create environments of wellness and health and flourishing? And the health capability profile is based on the based on the night the notion that we are agentive, we health agency, our ability to achieve health values that we health goals that we value, are our, our responsibility and our um, project in the context of society's responsibility and society's project. So it does not dichotomize between individuals and society. It is a collaborative, cooperative en endeavor. So the buy-in comes from understanding that we're really trying to get the complex experience gathered through data, understood, recognize the leverage points and change for the better. It's for the better. It's for health and well-being 
and wellness and flourishing. And we're on this end of the spectrum and we've got wonderful scientific research on diseases and the brain and the body system. And we've learned a lot. We have a COVID vaccine because we did a lot of great research. What are the conditions to prevent um, disease? to prevent the onset of ill experiences among people, to promote health and wellness and um, the good life, flourishing. And uh, uh, in terms of tools, the Health Equity and Policy Lab, we have um, on our research themes, health capability is one of our research themes. And so you can go there. And then if you just keep going through the, that research tab, you'll find more information. And we're, we're putting more up as we, as we go. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions coming in, which is, I suppose, timely because we're out of time as far as I can tell. <laughs> so I would like to thank our speaker once again for a very uh, interesting talk and a very interesting, uh, I think, policy tool um and if we could i, I don't know uh, it's hard to do when we're online but uh, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for for speaking with us today um in, in closing uh i would like to also to thank everyone who participated um and I would also note that the next talk uh, of the HLI seminar is on November 25th, but please stay tuned because um, I've been given a note here that uh, there has been a schedule change. So there's a, not a change of date, but a change of speaker. So next, uh, next seminar will be lawyer Alyssa Lum Lombard, uh, we'll be speaking on the topic of coerced sterilization of Indigenous women. Uh, so thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Pra, and please, everyone, have a good and safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all your comments. Yeah, no, it's really, uh, I think it's it's really interesting. Um, maybe before I let you go, I have I had one sort of question that arose from your last comment, if you had a moment. Are we on, are we, are we? Let me, let me stop recording. Um. <laughs>